welcome back. Around the same time that John Markley was creating ENIAC for the U.S. Army, another computer was being built in Bletchley Park, England. It was also in the middle, of course, of World War II. Just like Conrad Zuz was doing his thing in Berlin, you had people at the U.S. Army, but also in England, building computers. And it reminds us that war mobilizes science. Ever since Leonardo da Vinci uh, signed up to work for the warlord Caesar Borgia at around 1500, you can go throughout history and see how each new war or military need helps create new forms of technology. One of the interesting things about World War II though is that it wasn't just new weapon systems, it was computers that became crucial to the war effort. And what happened was in Bletchley Park, the British government gathered a group of mathematicians and thinkers and all sorts of brilliant people with the goal of breaking the German wartime code. The Germans were encrypting their messages. And of course, if uh, they could be intercepted and then decoded, that would give the allies Britain and the United States and its allies a great advantage. And so they recruited people for this wartime effort by many little tests, one of which was how well you could solve the crossword puzzle in the Daily Telegraph in England. And they called it Colonel Ridley's shooting party so that the people in the town of Bet Bletchley didn't quite know why these people were coming or going. Bletchley is a small town, and its main advantage for this was that it's halfway between Oxford University and Cambridge University on the rail line. Now, the point was to take what was known as the German Enigma coding machines. That's what you see on the screen. And the Germans would encode their messages by typing them in, and there were rotaries that would move back and forth so that each of the letters would be encrypted. And every time they did a new message, they changed the encryption on uh, the Enigma machines. That made it very hard to break. The British got a lucky, lucky uh, break when the Poles, some Polish soldiers captured one of the uh, encryption machines for Enigma. And for a while that was working, but the Germans caught on and they made it more sophisticated. They added more rotors, and so you needed some brilliant mathematician to help figure it out. The most brilliant of them of all was Alan Turing. We're gonna hear a lot about him. Later, we're gonna talk about his question of whether machines could think. But Alan Turing first became famous by going to Bletchley Park and helping to create the machines that would break the German code. When I wrote The Innovators, I was looking forward to making a Turing a little bit more famous. I thought people hadn't heard of him and they really should. But just as I was publishing the book, Benedict Cumberbatch played Turing in a movie called The Imitation Game, which you should, by the way, go see or uh, see on, uh, download it because it's really good about Bletchley Park and how they broke the German Enigma code. And so Benedict Cumberbatch ended up making Turing more famous. I didn't need to do it. But Turing, uh, to me, is somebody who represents the essence of figuring out the birth of the digital revolution. In 1936, right when Claude Shannon is doing his master's degree thesis on how you would do logic in circuits with on-off switches, Turing wrote a paper called On Computable Numbers. And he did it because he was trying to solve one of those great mathematics riddles uh, of the time. It was one of, uh, it was a riddle or a question about some mathematical uh, theories are unsolvable or some mathematical equations are unsolvable. There's some problems that we just haven't been able to solve. And the question was, is there a way to figure out when you have a mathematical question, whether or not it's solvable? Uh, to know, to be able to distinguish between those that are gonna be solvable and those that we're never going to solve. Turing did it by inventing in his head, 
the thought experiment, a conceptual machine that would do logical sequences and you would figure out from that whether or not a theory was solvable or not. Don't worry about the mathematical question of solving uh, this uh, dilemma of unsolvable equations. Just remember the universal computing machine, which is the thought experiment Turing had and came up with. And he said it's impossible to invent a single machine that can be used to compute any computable sequence. Once again, like Shannon, this is exactly a hundred years after Ada Lovelace is talking about creating a machine that can do any computable sequence, not just math, but anything that can be notated in logic. And finally, uh, you have Alan Turing coming up with this concept of how you would design a universal computing machine that could solve any problem or show that the problem was not solvable. And so what he did was he at Bletchley Park created a machine called the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. And what it did was it was able to take the German code, compare messages, and quickly see if you could decode it. And after a while, he had two operating bombs. There was a problem though. The Germans pretty much figured out that some of their messages must be getting decrypted. And so what they did is they, com they completed an even more complicated machine. And it took a new form of computer to try to break it. That's a guy named Tommy Flowers on your left. And he worked in something called Hut 11 at Bletchley Park. There's Hut 11. It's on the grounds of Bletchley Park. Tommy Flowers was an expert at using vacuum tubes, radio tubes, those things I told you that we use, we use in ENIAC, look like old incandescent light bulbs. And what he does is he creates a machine that uses vacuum team, tubes, just like John Vincent at a NASA had used a few of them at Iowa State University, and certainly ENIAC was using them at Penn, and they were able to store the German messages in memory and then compare them against the paper tape of new memory. And by December 1943, the people at Bletchley Park, led by Tommy Flowers, Alan Turing, and a guy named Max Newman, were able in December 43 to create what was known as Colossus. You see a picture of it there, 1,500 vacuum tubes, and soon by June 1944, right near as the war was. Uh, in its last year, they created a version with 2,400 uh, tubes. And that version, just as it came online in June 1944, did perhaps the most important single thing in winning World War II in the European theater. And that was, it broke the messages of the German military right before D-Day, before Eisenhower lands in Normandy uh, with D-Day, and it made sure that the Germans were confused and were not preparing for a Normandy landing. Uh, before, so that means that before ENIAC, which was November 1945, the British had a fully electronic and digital computer. In fact, it was binary, used on off switches. But unlike ENIAC, which had 10 times the number of tubes, Colossus was a special purpose machine. It was designed only to break the German code. It couldn't do missile trajectories. It couldn't do atom bomb explosions, all the other things. So it was not what we call Turing complete, meaning it could do any computable sequence. Or to put it another way, it was not like Ada Lovelace's dream of a general purpose computer. Which leads us to the question, who invented the first computer. And that, of course, depends, like most questions, on how you define something. Like, how do you define a computer? And we don't really want to say an abacus is a computer or that an adding machine is a computer. So we can look at the early people in the early 1940s who worked on computers, George Stibbets there in the upper left and Howard Aiken next to him, Conrad Zuse in his lab in Berlin, John Adenoff at Iowa State, Alan Turing, uh, 
uh, Tommy Flowers, out at Fletchley Park, they all invented some form of the modern computer. But for me, I would define a computer. I would say, here's the necessary ingredients a computer has to have. This is just me. Other people can argue what was the first computer. And to me, to be a computer, the way we define it today, what we mean when we say computer, is it's gotta be digital. In fact, not just digital, which can use any numbers like one through 10 or something, but binary, on, off switches, yes, no. Doing it in circuit with switches that turn, or vacuum tubes that turn on and off. There's gotta be digital and binary. It's gotta be, to my mind, electronic. Using mechanical switches, that's not, if you saw something like that, you wouldn't say that's the modern computer. And to me, just like Ada Lovelace says, it has to be general purpose. So the winner is, to me, ENIAC. And there you have Press Record on the left, John Mockley, Gene Bartik, and others at the University of Pennsylvania doing what I would call the world's first uh, computer, a binary, digital, electronic, general purpose computer. Thanks.